Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we have a case that, from the outside looking in, seems to almost solve itself. But the reporting on it has been lacking from the very beginning. Since 1982, up until 2000, only a handful of articles seem to have covered this investigation, with a Facebook post in 2015 being the most recent. When a 27-year-old female disappeared, all signs pointed to one individual as being involved. As investigators gathered more evidence, they began to hone in even further on their suspect, but they were still missing one crucial piece of evidence. Today, we're covering the mysterious disappearance and potential murder of Julianne Miller. Julianne Miller was born in 1955 in Deep River, Connecticut, where she grew up with her family. From what I could gather, it appeared as though she had a good relationship with her parents and had at least one sibling, a brother named Carl. She attended the Valley Regional High School located in Deep River, Connecticut, and would go on to graduate in 1973. After graduation, she went on to complete an undergraduate degree at Connecticut College in New London, and at the time of our story, she was attending the University of Hartford working through a graduate program. The specifics of what she was studying is one of the many missing details that haven't been reported on. As Julianne was working towards the completion of that degree, she was also working part-time at a daycare center, presumably to pay for her tuition. In her free time, outside of working at the daycare and busting her butt to get through college, Julianne loved to roller skate. On an evening in 1981, as she was participating in one of her favorite pastimes at a local roller rink in Old Saybrook, Connecticut, she had a chance encounter with a young man by the name of James Clayton. The two would hit it off and began dating. They had a lot in common, not only sharing a love of roller skating, but the two each had a passion for karate as well. James so much so that he had worked his way up to the rank of black belt. It's reported that the two began taking karate lessons together shortly after they started seeing each other. During the following year, 1982, the two's relationship had grown to the point where they were now living together at Julianne's home located at 27 Clinton Ave in Old Saybrook, a cute little colonial often described as a cottage, which was located only a short distance from a body of water called South Cove. Julianne's father, Carlton Miller, had transferred ownership of the home to her sometime in 1981. I attempted to locate more details regarding the property and its ownership history, even looking through the old Saybrook Tax Assessor's website, but strangely enough, couldn't find any information prior to 2009. I found that a bit odd, as the home was built in 1935, and we know of at least two prior owners, just based on Carlton and Julianne. Now, you may ask what set me on this mission. It's just a house. What's the big deal? Well, what happens a short time after Julianne was gifted the property is what sets most of our story in motion. Sometime in 1982, Julianne goes on to deed half of her new home to her boyfriend James. You'd have to assume that she believed their relationship was in a good enough position to warrant giving up half the equity in the home to him. But unfortunately, once this process had been completed, the contentment didn't last and the couple entered into a downward spiral. As things got worse, Julianne decided that she wanted to undo the agreement and went on to have a quitclaim deed drafted in order to remove James from the deed. There was only one problem, though. She needed his signature. I'm sure that didn't go well. It doesn't seem like this was a coincidence that right after he's on the deed, their relationship goes to crap. It's definitely suspicious. I'm not sure why James would need to be put on the deed in the first place. Yeah, they weren't even in a long-term relationship. I've got to assume that James manipulated Julianne into this for some type of control or financial gain. Well, it's funny you say that, because when looking up the property today, it's worth nearly $700,000. And back in 2009, it had been sold for about $470,000. You'd have to guess that it was likely worth a pretty penny back in 82. Even if it was only worth, say, $200,000, that right there is 100 dollars down the drain for Julianne 
and into James's pocket if she were to ever try and sell the property with him still on the deed. It's believed that on September 20th, 1982, Julianne picked up the quitclaim deed and presumably the next evening confronted James about her plans to have him sign away his ownership rights to the property. Based on witness statements, it seems as though James was less than thrilled with the request. One of the two tenants living with Julianne and James at the time, who was reportedly named David McDonald, later told police that he'd seen the couple that same evening, the 21st, watching TV in the living room, but it appeared as though the two had been arguing, describing the atmosphere in the room as tense. I know the exact vibe he's talking about too. It's almost like it manifests in the air. When people are arguing or going through some crap together, you can literally feel the tension. This encounter would turn out to be the last time Julianne was ever reported to have been seen by anyone other than James. An official report would later be generated, marking the date of Julianne's disappearance as September 22nd. However, it's believed that she may have vanished the previous night, sometime after her and James were seen watching TV. Well, I think we can say James is involved here. Seems pretty obvious. Oh, I know. And get this. Even though that report claims she went missing on the 22nd, Julianne wasn't reported missing until the 29th, seven days later. And no, not by her tenants and not by James. Suspicious doesn't even begin to describe this guy. But what about her dad? I'm sure he was worried after not hearing from or seeing his daughter. Well, we discover that Carlton Miller was actually out of town since September 20th, the day before Julianne was last seen by McDonald, her tenant. Her father didn't arrive home from his vacation until the 29th, and upon his return, he was notably concerned by the fact that she was literally nowhere to be found. Carlton was the one who ended up calling police to report Julianne missing. James never said a word. And the reasons pointing towards James as responsible continue to grow. As authorities began their search for the missing woman, they started with those close to her, and one of the very first people who was questioned was James. No surprise there, but things with James didn't start out too hot. They started with the easy questions. You know, like, uh, why didn't you report your girlfriend missing after you hadn't seen her for a week? And why did you not seem concerned, yet... When her father found out, he reported her disappearance immediately? Well, based on what's reported, it looks like James ended up giving two different responses to these questions. The first, and seemingly more commonly discussed, is that he didn't want to report her missing because he didn't want her to, quote, get in trouble. Get in trouble? Wasn't she, like, 27 years old? Who's going to be reprimanding this grown-ass adult? And for what? James went on to elaborate explaining to authorities that her father had asked that she stay home and keep an eye on things while he was gone. Okay, and when she vanished out of thin air? I'm sure her dad's first thought was, gosh dang it, where'd that girl run off to? She's supposed to be keeping an eye on things. (laughs) Right? Even if this was true, which I'm almost certain it's total BS, what was she keeping an eye on? She lived in the house with James and those two tenants, David McDonald and his friend Gordon Dunn. Her dad, Carlton, had given her the house a year earlier, so why would she need to keep an eye on things? Julianne's father also owned another property on a 70-acre plot of land in Deep River, which was only about a 10-15 to minute drive away. Maybe that's what she was supposed to be watching? Maybe, but even so, I'd be more worried about her well-being after not seeing her for a week than I would be about a stern talking to from her father. Exactly. I don't think James was thinking along the same lines we are, though. His responses are more tailored to trying to cover his tracks rather than making the appropriate decision in a situation like this. The other response James gave that was only listed in a couple sources was that he supposedly didn't want to, quote, jeopardize her chances at getting a job with the state police. Where the hell did that come from? I have no idea. I'm so lost when it comes to his responses during this interrogation. I've been unable to find any sources that explain what she'd been studying in college, so who knows if she was really trying to get a job with the state police. Regardless, I can't see how her going missing would negatively impact her chances of employment. Neither do I, but either way, as police continued to question James, they asked him another basic question. Now, the following answer is what really sparked my interest in this case. 
I was so stunned by the stupidity of his response that I just had to dig deeper and find out more about what happened here. So police asked James, when was the last time he saw Julianne? He went on to reply that he last saw her, presumably on the 21st, getting into a brown pickup truck that was occupied by a black male. Now, I'm sure you're saying, okay, Britt, you really built that one up. Why is this so significant? Well, it turns out that Mr. Clayton is not only a black male, but also one that drives, yep, you guessed it, a brown pickup truck. (laughs) All I can think of are those Obi-Wan Kenobi memes. I'm sure police's next question was, do you know who that black male was? And James's response, well, of course I know him. He's me. (laughs) I know. Police obviously know he fits the exact description he just gave. Why would you give a response essentially implicating yourself as the person she'd gotten into this truck with? If I had to try and make sense of it, I'd assume that he was trying to stay as close to the truth as possible to keep his story straight. But who knows? Regardless of the authenticity behind James's statement, police move their investigation to the couple's Clinton Ave home in search for clues leading to Julianne's whereabouts. During the hunt, authorities located several interesting pieces of evidence. The first item that caught police's attention was the living room couch. It was missing its cushions and, according to some sources, had portions cut out of it. Along with the current condition of the couch, A witness told investigators that the entire living room, for some reason, had been rearranged. What could the reasoning behind this be? Well, when authorities questioned James about it, he replied by stating that he'd brought the cushions to be dry cleaned. Dry cleaned? I didn't even think that was a thing for furniture. But more importantly, what the hell could have happened to those cushions to require that in the first place? I mean, come on. I think we're all thinking the same thing. James must have been trying to destroy evidence. Oh yeah, big time. So, moving on from the cushion mystery, the statement made by that witness in regards to the whole feng shui of the room changing also piqued my interest. The last time Julianne was seen, she'd been sitting on that couch with James. What sparked the need to rearrange the room, if not to try and conceal something? Whether that be damage to the room, stains that had been cleaned, or any other type of evidence possibly linking to Julianne's disappearance. No matter what James's reasoning was for moving stuff around, police must have tore that place apart looking for clues. Oh, absolutely. One thing that crossed my mind that I wish was reported had to do with the witness coming forward to police. I wasn't able to determine whether or not this person was one of the tenants living in the same house, or maybe even the one that had seen James and Julianne together. Oof, yeah. Knowing that, and especially what else police may have learned from them, would help with forming a timeline of events after Julianne was last seen. Especially if the witness was a tenant. If they were home and heard something going on between the couple, that could be huge. Exactly. I'm not sure what the living quarters looked like, but the house was labeled as having an upper story and a three-quarter story on the tax assessor's website. And in recent pictures listed on some realtor sites, there also appeared to be some type of studio above the detached garage. So even if the tenants were home, there's the possibility that they wouldn't have heard anything based on where they were on the property. But let's get back to the evidence. As police continued to search the home, they located Julianne's eyeglasses and purse. Inside the purse, her wallet, money, credit cards, all remained untouched and tucked alongside those items, the quitclaim deed that she'd just gotten drafted. Also left behind were her beloved golden retriever Bojo and her car, which was still parked outside. Where would she have willingly ran off to without any of these items? She'd have no ID or money, and she certainly wouldn't have left Bojo behind. You've got to be thinking that the night McDonald saw Julianne and James watching TV must have been around the time Julianne brought up the quitclaim deed. That'd definitely be a reason for the two to be arguing, making the tension between the two evident, even to someone just walking through the room. That's what I was thinking, and to go further with that, could this argument have gotten so intense that it sent James into a rage, accidentally or maybe even purposefully killing Julianne? At this point, I think anything's possible. Well, as the search for clues throughout the home continued authorities became more and more suspicious of James and his involvement in Julianne's disappearance. Investigators went on to find bleach stains on the living room carpet 
and upon further inspection, several small blood stains on the couch and its springs. This begs the question, why would James take the couch cushions to get dry cleaned, cut out portions of it, but try to bleach the carpet? Why not just get rid of it? And the couch, to have blood stains left behind, even after the effort was put in to clean it all up, makes you think that there must have been a fair amount of it. It sure does. I feel like the better thing to do, if James was trying to cover something up, would have been to just get rid of everything entirely. Yeah, I'm not sure what he was thinking, and it turns out that when police asked him who the blood belonged to, he had another brilliant answer. He said it was the dogs. Good lord. On any other day, and if his girlfriend hadn't been missing for a week without him notifying anyone, maybe I'd believe him. Psh, even then, I'd still be suspicious. So police end up seizing the carpet and the bloodstained pieces of the couch and store them in evidence. Now, it's unclear when authorities learned of this next piece of info, but at some point, they determined that several pieces of valuable jewelry had been taken from Julianne's belongings, most notably a gold necklace, a large diamond ring, and her grandmother's wedding ring. One last thing I wanted to touch on, which was only mentioned in one article, was a small blurb stating that police had located a receipt in James's truck. It was from a gas station north of Hartford, Connecticut, from right around the time of Julianne's disappearance. The article went on to state that the Millers owned a property in Blandford, Mass, that Clayton had been to at least one time. I plotted out the distances between these locations and came up with these estimated travel times. Old Saybrook to Deep River was about 15 minutes, like I went over earlier. Then Deep River to Hartford was roughly an hour and a half, and from Hartford to Blandford was another hour. Besides the Miller's property in Blandford, it doesn't appear as though there are any noticeable landmarks along the route, outside of some smaller bodies of water. There were no further reports alluding to this receipt or any leads it may have produced. So at this point, it seemed as though investigators had a fair bit of information to go off of. The statement regarding Julianne and James's argument, the blood-stained couch and missing cushions, the bleached carpet, the missing valuables, and the shady story James had been trying to weave. Not to mention all of Julianne's personal property still left inside the home, including her dog, who she would have never left behind. It's clear that police had conducted some exceptional work in the early days of the investigation, even just off of the clues found within the couple's home. They went on to question all the pertinent people you might expect, especially those close to Julianne. As they worked through their findings, authorities were eventually able to locate her grandmother's wedding ring that had been taken, and more importantly, the person who pawned it. Now, if you were James, or someone who believed his story, you'd probably say that Julianne could have gotten rid of it herself. But come on, we all know that's not true. So was it James? Close. It turns out that it was his brother. Ah, the plot thickens. Indeed. He had pawned the wedding ring at a shop in New Haven, Connecticut, which was about an hour and a half drive from Old Saybrook. So straight away, my mind went to work, trying to imagine the different scenarios that could have led to this. If we start out as reserved as possible, we could say that perhaps James's brother, Jerome, had no clue about what was going on, and for some reason, James asked him to pawn it for him. Yeah, I'm not buying that one. Okay, so what if somehow Jerome had become aware of something evil his brother had done, and the ring was payment to keep him quiet? That's closer to believable, but I'm going to take that a step further. Let's assume Jerome was also black and just so happened to either be using James's truck or had his own brown pickup truck. This would coincide with James's statement to police, and going along with that idea, I'm thinking that James could have purposefully enlisted his brother's help in killing Julianne, or at least disposing of her body. Then he paid Jerome with the various jewelry that had been missing, in particular, the wedding ring. You read my mind. That's the scenario I was getting to. By this point, I'm of the opinion, and it appears that you are too, that Julianne was unfortunately already dead and that James and Jerome were both involved. One thing I found interesting was how far away the ring was pawned. Perhaps the two didn't believe investigators would search that far out? Either that or maybe the shop just happened to be along the route they traveled while disposing of any evidence. Good thinking. But no matter the reason, it seemed like police were on James's tail. 
As authorities continued to build their case against James Clayton, he would begin acting strange. You mean stranger than he already was? Yeah, and it wasn't good. It's reported that James started making phone calls to Julianne's parents late into the night for months after her disappearance. Her father, Carlton, never disclosed what was said during those conversations, but based on statements from other family members, whatever it was, it had the family spooked. I think it's fair to assume that he was making threats, probably in an attempt to scare the Millers out of pushing forward with the investigation. I figured that was the case too. James could have gone to the extent to say that if Carlton even told police what was said, that he'd come after them, which would explain why the details of their talks were never made public. And just a side note, is it just me or does it seem like a common occurrence for family members of victims to receive either harassing or threatening phone calls? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's really odd. While police attempted to round out their investigation, they went on to administer polygraph tests to both McDonald and Dunn, the tenants that had been living with Julianne and James. They both passed. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, if those two tenants took a polygraph, what about James? Well, it turns out he was asked to, but declined. I wonder why. It was also later revealed that at some point, once the investigation had began, James evicted both McDonald and Dunn from the house. What a nice guy. Right? One article I read had a statement from McDonald, which read, quote, Jim just told us she had gone with family to New Jersey on vacation. And, quote, I think he kicked us out because we started asking too many questions. Yeah, no shit. If he refused the polygraph, it's probably because he knew he'd get caught in a lie. Now that he's the sole owner of the house, why would he want these other people breathing down his neck? It'd only be a matter of time before he slipped up and said something stupid. Or even worse... If they had pushed him too hard, could he have snapped and went after them too? So at this point in the story, it's the end of 1982, roughly three months after Julianne disappeared and there's still no sign of her anywhere. No credit card usage, no opening of new accounts, no sightings, nothing. Police publicly announce that James Clayton is their number one prime suspect in her disappearance. However, as time continued to pass, James was never arrested, and Julianne's case would go cold for nearly 18 years. During the time since his daughter went missing, Carlton Miller had entered a legal battle with James. He'd learned about the quitclaim deed Julianne had been in possession of and wished to move forward in taking back the property from Clayton. Just prior to judgment being provided in the case, most likely in Carlton Miller's favor, the cottage mysteriously caught fire. So James is an arsonist now too, eh? Certainly seems that way, but nobody was ever arrested for setting the blaze. Uh, okay. I know. In September of 2000, an article published by the Hartford Current provided insight as to where the investigation stood up to that point. We learned that the current deputy chief, Thomas O'Brien, had been the lead investigator on the case. It stated that for the past 18 years, he's remained vigilant in the search for Julianne Miller but the investigation had certainly been stifled as police remained unable to locate her body. With his career nearing its end, O'Brien and Chief Edmund Mosca dug back into the case for another look, enlisting the help of the cold case squad, which was ran by an old classmate of Julianne's, Christopher Morona. Morona's squad utilized new methodology in way of DNA testing in order to find the missing links in unsolved cases. It stated that some of the items police had collected from Miller's home were still in their possession and waiting to be tested. Among them were the bloodstains from the couch and the bleached carpet. When speaking about this investigation, Morona stated, quote, This is a case where there is forensic evidence we can examine, but it's also a tough case because her body has never been found, end quote. This seemed to be an utterance that had been echoed throughout Julianne's case time and time again. Without her body police seemed, quote, no closer to solving the mystery of the disappearance than when it happened, as was stated by Chief Mosca. This must have been so frustrating for everyone involved. I mean, the writing's on the wall. James is the one responsible. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure they all knew that no-body homicides are some of the toughest to prosecute, and for obvious reasons, as insensitive as it may seem. According to an article in the New Haven Register titled Missing in Connecticut, 
no body murder cases difficult to solve but possible, it states, quote, A prosecution without a body can be challenging. Tad DiBiase, a former federal prosecutor who manages the website nobodymurdercases.com, said in any murder case, the body is the best evidence. The body gives you information about when, where, and how the murder happened. Without it, it's like being in a 100-meter race where the murderer starts on the 20-meter line. They're ahead right away because they were able to dispose of the body. I think, traditionally, prosecutors have been reluctant to take a case to trial because they're missing their best piece of evidence, end quote. It makes sense. The jury's job is to convict beyond a reasonable doubt. I could see how it would be difficult to not have some doubt when the person the defendant supposedly killed has never been found. Exactly. A jury's decision could be tainted by the fact that there isn't absolute certainty that the victim couldn't walk into that courtroom at any moment. However, in this case, I do feel as though the circumstantial evidence is strong enough to bring forward charges at a minimum. But it seems like authorities don't feel up to the task, making it seem like the risk is greater than the reward at this point, at least in 2000 when that article was written. Listen. I understand double jeopardy and not wanting James to get away with murder if a jury would not convict, but how is that any different than never charging him to begin with? He's been walking free for all this time. At least through a trial, there's a chance justice could be served. I totally agree, as does Julianne's brother, Carl. In that same article from 2000, and in regards to police and the investigation, he stated, quote, They seem to know who did it, and they tell me they're waiting for the right opportunity. If that's the case, then they should take their best shot because it's been too long already, end quote. That's what I'm saying. By 2000, it had been 18 years since her disappearance. Now, it's approaching 40. This girl deserves justice, and if the only way to get it is based on a coin toss, I say go for it. 100%. I think that if there were charges brought against James, there's a chance he might even accept a plea deal and give them information on where Julianne's body is, as opposed to going to trial. As I searched for more up-to-date information on the case, something popped up regarding another case that James Clayton was involved in later in life. And honestly, it's sickening, especially knowing that if he had been in prison, then this second tragedy could have been avoided. At some point, James enlisted into the military, and in November of 2001, he was stationed at the Schofield Barracks located in Honolulu, Hawaii, serving in the Army Medical Corps. During this time, James attempted to rob one of his fellow officers, striking them in the head with a hammer, fracturing their skull, nearly killing them. Thankfully, this officer survived, and James Clayton was arrested and charged with attempted murder. When questioned about the attack, Clayton came up with the excuse that he, quote, blacked out and couldn't remember the incident, end quote. Here we go again with this guy. I'm sure he didn't remember doing the same thing to his ex-girlfriend either. I know. And with this attempted murder happening during the commission of a robbery, it brought me right back to Julianne and the quitclaim deed. What if, when she tried to get James to sign it, he flipped and attempted to steal her valuable jewelry as replacement for the equity he would lose from the house? Then, as Julianne tried to stop him, he killed her. That makes perfect sense. Then James could have given Jerome the wedding ring to help dispose of the evidence while keeping the other jewelry for himself. Yep. If this more recent crime was the next event in James's pattern of violence, I could totally see this being what happened in 82. After James was charged for the attempted murder of his fellow officer, he was convicted in military court in April of 2002 and sentenced to five years in prison. He went on to serve that sentence in the prison located at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Something that I couldn't stand was that as I looked into this attempted murder charge and subsequent conviction, there was practically no information on it, like barely a few fleeting mentions with only one article being somewhat dedicated to it. Maybe because it was tried in military court? Who cares? This guy is a violent felon. This should be public information. I can't even find a damn picture of him anywhere. Yeah, that's strange. You'd think there'd be some type of article with his image. If not for the military charges, then the investigation into Julianne's disappearance. Putting my annoyance aside... James's new conviction brought him back onto police's radar. Investigators in Connecticut dove back into Julianne's case with a renewed vigor, putting forth their theory of what happened and planning another search for clues. 
Authorities stated that they believed James killed Julianne in the house the night she disappeared. And after cleaning up the scene, he went on to bury her body somewhere on the quote, property. Now, this is where the lack of reporting got frustrating. When Julianne is assumably killed in Old Saybrook, and authorities are saying that James buried her on the property, you'd think they're referring to the cottage on Clinton Ave, but they weren't. Investigators believed that Julianne's body was buried on the 70-acre property in Deep River, owned by her father, Carlton. But before moving on with that, I wanted to mention that I can't stop thinking about the Clinton Ave property and how it's located right next to South Cove, which we talked about earlier. South Cove is a body of water that empties out into the Connecticut River, which dumps right into the middle of the Long Island and Block Island sounds. Well, knowing that, it sure seems like an easier place to dispose of a body than digging a shallow grave on Julianne's family's property. If James had thrown her body into the waterways, it could have floated out to who knows where. Or he could have even waded down and she could be at the bottom of one of those bodies of water. It's just a thought, and one contradictory to where it seems investigators had been led. So, in regards to the Deep River property, it appears as though, through the years, multiple searches have taken place here, with the use of dogs, infrared detection equipment, and an army aircraft equipped with radar, all ending with negative results. Even so, with investigators' attention back on the case, they resumed their search for clues. They began re-interviewing old witnesses and sent out the blood from the couch for DNA testing. Sadly, it doesn't appear as though they garnered anything of value, and as of January 2022, no arrests have been made in connection to the disappearance of Julianne Miller. You'd think that with advancements in technology, that investigators could find something useful, especially from the DNA tests. I know, and I just can't wrap my mind around the fact that the last real reporting on this case was 20 years ago. It's definitely a shame. How could there be no movement, no updates, Nobody really even talking about the case from what it seems, outside of that Facebook post and some other write-ups on forums. Unfortunately, I think it's because most of Julianne's family are deceased now. It seems like she may only have one remaining relative, and her brother Carl. I read a quote from him in one of the articles, and it was really sad. He said, quote, I'm like my father in that we work at a problem and work at it, and if you can't fix it at some point, you just stop trying, end quote. I truly can't fathom the pain he's felt through all of this, but I can understand where he's coming from. The burden he and his family carried for all these years has weighed him down to the point where he can't continue the fight, but he shouldn't have to be the only one fighting. Julianne deserves to be found. She deserves to be laid to rest with her parents, who died without knowing what happened to their daughter, and her case deserves to be solved. Someone out there has to know something. There's currently a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest and conviction in this case, and maybe that's enough to finally bring someone forward. If you have any information regarding the murder of Julianne Miller or the location of her remains, please contact the Connecticut Cold Case Unit tip line at 860-548-0606 in the Hartford area or toll-free at 1-866-623-623. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at wickeddeeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.